I welcome everybody today to this glorious Sunday. Today is Sunday, 16th June 2019. And it looks like a coincidence, but with God, there's never a coincidence because it's 16th of June and we are reading Matthew 16, verse 16. Everything is about 16 today. With God, there is never a coincidence. So he who has ears, let him hear. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 says, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's our reading for today. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your everlasting word, your word that is tried seven times. There can be no fault in your word. We thank you that you, you bring us into the mystery of who you are. We thank you that you have opened your door unto us and you have let us in. So, Lord, we sit right now at your feet and our faces are on you. Our eyes are on you. We ask that you would speak right deep into our souls and our spirit. Father, let us never come to you and go away the same. We surrender our wills to you and we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Have full control, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. So the title of our message today is Knowing Him. Knowing Him. Knowing Him. Who, who is the Him? Knowing who? That's knowing Jesus as the Christ. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the question is, do you know Jesus? Or do you just know about him? Do you know his name? Do you know his heart? Do you know his will? Do you know his ways? How do you know him? What makes you think or what makes you believe that you know him? I want us to think about that. If you say you know Jesus, Ask yourself now, just one to one in your heart, how do I know him? Do I really know him? Do I just know about him because I hear people mention the name Jesus? Or do I believe that I know him? You have to remember, Jesus <coughs> had called his disciples. He was walking with them and talking with them and living with them on a daily basis. So why would he now ask them this question that we are treating today? If you go back to that Matthew 16 verse 18. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Who do people say that I am? Why, why do you think he had them? He was, he was there with them. Why did he need to ask them if they knew him? Oh, but Jesus, I'm seeing, I'm seeing you. I'm talking to you. Why are you asking me if I know you? Why do you, you know, all these people are seeing you. But Jesus, had, the same way he asked his disciples that day, he's asking you today. Who do men say that I am? And so they started answering. Oh, they said, uh, you are John the Baptist. Yeah, but John the Baptist was just beheaded, and we all know that. Some say Elijah, but we know Elijah was taken up in the chariot of fire. And others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. That's what most people now in the world likes to say. Oh, Jesus is just one of the prophets. Okay, Jesus says, okay, you are my disciples. You are my friends. And now you are telling me what others say about me. 
Now, verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say? Who do you say that I am? You, my disciples, you, you the ones I'm talking to, who do you say that I am? And they were like, oh. See, it's easier to say, oh, they say that, and they say that, and, but what are you saying? What are you saying in your heart? Only Peter, and not by himself, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. You cannot know Jesus apart from the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the only person that can make Jesus known to you in reality. Otherwise, you just, you see him, you hear about him, you pass on your way. He doesn't have any impact in your life. He doesn't have any, any value to you. You just know him as you know the next person. Oh, one of the prophets. So Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what we need to declare in our, in our, with our mouth and believe in our hearts. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one that came to redeem the world. He is not just any other prophet. He is the prophet of prophets. Because everything comes from him and through him and for him. He made it all. Any other prophet that has been, that power was given to him by, you know, by Jesus. If Jesus doesn't give a prophet the word to speak, he cannot speak it. Then he is a lying prophet. Because Jesus is the word of God. If he, the word of God, if you are not speaking the word of God, then you are lying. If you are not declaring that Jesus is God, then you don't know God because Jesus is the word of God. He is God himself. If you just think that Jesus is another person, then you don't know God. Then you haven't heard his voice. Because if you say you know God and God is speaking to you, then you must know his voice and know the word. So whose word are you speaking? If you are not speaking Jesus. Because Jesus is the word. You cannot say God sent you. And you don't know Jesus. Then you are just a lying prophet. So verse 17. Jesus answered. After Peter had declared that. You know. Jesus is the Christ. The son of the living God. Jesus answered him in verse 17 and said to him, Blessed are you. You see, the moment you declare Jesus as Lord, as, as King, as God, then the blessing starts to flow because now your mind is open. You have received the revelation for life. Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah. That means Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You cannot know God by going to the university to study about him. It's not flesh and blood. It's not human intellect. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You can only know Jesus by revelation, by, by divine revelation. So, going back to the disciples, to you and I, it's easy for the disciples to have said, Oh, but why, why are you asking us, Jesus? You are, you are Jesus, son of Joseph and Mary. Who else? Why are you asking us? That means you just see him in the flesh. And Paul says, I know no man after the flesh. If you don't know it in the spirit, then that, that knowing is, has no basis. Jesus, you, you, you are the son of Mary. 
you are the son of Joseph. I know you are brothers and sisters. Why are you asking me if, if I know you? But that's not the knowing. Knowing him is in the spirit. Flesh and blood cannot reveal Jesus to you. No amount of preaching that I do can reveal Jesus to you. Until the day you are ready to open up your heart, to open up your mind, to release your spirit and say, Jesus, I've been hearing of you. Who are you really? I want to know you. No amount of preaching or teaching can make anybody know Jesus. Because Jesus walked and talked with his disciples, told him everything, talked about his own death and resurrection. It was entering one ear and going out of the other. And Jesus said at the end, because of his love, in the Gospel of John, you know guys, I've told you so much, but I know that you are not getting it. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you into all truths. Without the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit of the living God, without the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus to you in your spirit man, no amount of education and teaching and preaching can do it. No flesh and blood can do it. We have to release ourselves and say, Jesus, I've been hearing of you. I know about you. I hear about you. But can you now show me yourself? Reveal yourself to me. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship God in the flesh. Without a spiritual divine revelation, you are just doing religion. And religion is cursed. Jesus used to curse the Pharisees because they were doing the doctrines of man and living the ways of God. There is something mysterious about God that no human flesh can, can, can understand. He makes himself easy, but until you come to him like a child, he's so easy, the, the, the intelligent ones miss him because he wants us to have the heart of a child. Just love me as a one-year-old, two-year-old loves his mother or daddy. Don't try to explain it. You don't teach a one-year-old or a two-year-old how to love his mommy or his daddy. He just loves them. That's the mystery. They haven't gone to school to learn how to love. Because love is in the heart, not in the brain. A lot of people think they know Jesus until he confronts you with the story or with the question. Now, who, who, who do you say that I am? How do you really see me? What is your perception about me? This question is supposed to prompt us to think deeper. How do I see Jesus? It's supposed to prompt us to, to search deeper and harder and are more focused. I thought it was obvious that I knew Jesus, but is it that obvious? Jesus, I thought I knew you. I'm, 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 I'm walking with you. I'm talking with you. Why are you asking me if I know you? I thought that was obvious. But it's not that obvious. God is knocking on the, mind, the, the doors of our minds and hearts today. Think deeper. 
Think about it. Who is Jesus? Who do the people in the world believe him to be? And who do I believe him to be? If you go to Psalm 103 verse 7, Psalm 103 verse 7, it says, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. Psalm 103, verse 7. Oh, if, 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 we, if we even read from verse 6. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. So he steps in for you even when you don't know it. Because through the, the, the execution of his justice and righteousness in your life, he wants you to, to say, oh, you know what? I just thought of that thing and it happened. I, I hardly ever prayed about it. It was just in my heart. And God did it. So God executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He steps in and does things for you when you didn't expect, so that it will prompt you to think and to give him thanks. And verse 7 says, he made known his ways to Moses. So he wants you to know him. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The children of Israel only saw the big miracles out there. They, they saw it from afar. They had no personal relationship. How come Moses knew his ways and the children of Israel only knew his acts because they lacked intimacy. Love is intimate. Love is personal. They lacked the intimacy that Moses had with the Lord. Moses will go to the mountain and stay there 40 days, come back and see them. They have sinned. He prayed for them and went back another 40 days. Love is intimate. You need to get close to know the person you say you love. You can you cannot just have somebody, you know, you know, like Facebook today. We have friends all around the world. We've never seen them any day, and we call them friends. There has to be something intimate about love. Moses spent time with the Lord. The children of Israel only saw from a distance what God was doing. And God is happy to do these things. But when he does it, it's supposed to prompt us to say, how come that is that? How come this is this? He should prompt us to search. The epistle of James, chapter 4, verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He executes his righteousness and justice so that you see it. And that prompts you to draw near to him. When you now choose to draw near to him, he will now start to reveal himself to you. He will draw near to you. But what is the one thing that keeps us from drawing near to God? It's sin. Sin. And it comes with doubt. It comes with unbelief. It comes with fear. It comes with shame. Oh, I'm not good enough. So I've not done enough. I've not prayed enough. So he says, go and wash your hands. Jesus has provided his blood. Remember Pilate. Pilate washed his hands and said, I am not in charge of this man's blood. That James chapter 4 verse 8 says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. Don't be double-minded with God. Don't doubt Submit to him and he will give you the power to resist doubt, to resist fear, to put away shame, to, 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 to resist fear and keep you away from that life of sin which separates you from God. These are the things that keep us away from God. 
And if we are not close enough to him, we can never know him. You cannot know God from a distance. You have to make up your mind to draw near to him, according to John uh, James 4, 8. It's a personal choice. You meet somebody, you decide whether to be friends with that person or not. Nobody is forcing you. Don't run away from him. Run to him. His blood, it's only, it is only his blood that is going to cleanse you from all that doubt and fear and sin and shame. He already loved you enough and proved it to you by dying for you. Greater love had no man than this. He has proved that he loves you. Right from the beginning in Genesis, before the fall of Adam, before sin came into the world, there was no fear, there was no shame, there was no pain, there was no confusion, there was no sickness. In the beginning, everything was perfect because there was no sin. It is sin that brings all this bad thing that we blame God for. Oh God, why did you do this? Oh God, why? No, God did not do it. It is sin that did it. Because human beings chose to, to believe Satan and doubt God. Imperfection came when human beings chose to doubt and disobey his maker. Everything was perfect at the beginning. But today, in God's love and mercy, he wants you to know him for who he is. That perfect God, that loving God, Christ, the, the anointed one, the, the holy son of God, the one that loved you so much, that he gave up himself freely and willingly so that we might be restored, restored from all that Adam destroyed. <coughs> Jesus came to restore us, to give us back. We sang it today. I didn't even choose the song. You have to take back all that the enemy has stolen from you. Satan came and destroyed so much. Human beings believed Satan more than they want to believe God. And he comes to steal, kill, destroy. While Jesus has come to give us life and life abundantly. But because Satan's lies are so sweet. See, the, the, the Issue with Adam and Eve is not about Adam and Eve, it's about you and me. What can we learn from that story? Satan will come with a sweet tongue. He will come with sweet words. And instead of us to remind ourselves, no, God said so. God, because as he's talking loud here, the Holy Spirit is talking gentle and steady. Gentle and steady. But God said. But God said, said, and said, don't believe it. Did he really say? Did he really say? You have to choose the voice that you listen to. Satan is, is oppressive. He's a bully. But the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. But we want to see the storm rather than the still, quiet voice which is the true presence of God. God wants to restore all that Adam had destroyed. We have to choose restoration and not destruction. Do you know him as your restorer? Do you know him? We are talking about knowing him today. Do you know him as your savior? Do you know him as your redeemer? Do you know him as your healer? Do you know him as the prince of peace? Do you know him as the lover of your soul? Do you know him, the one with all the power and all the authority? 
Do we know him as that one, the only one who can establish us and nothing can shift it? Because if you go back to that Matthew that we were reading, Matthew 16, after he declares, Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. He goes on to say, verse 18, and I say, sorry, and I also say, so he's, he's putting like a weight on what he said, making you double sure. After he has blessed you and confirmed that you couldn't have known him without the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, I also say to you that you, Peter, Put your name in it. You, Victoria, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So he's giving you his assurance. He has blessed you and he puts his stamp of authority on you. And he says, do not worry. Since you know me today, leave it all for me. I will build my church. He's not asking, you are the rock. Yes, I will use you because I'm in heaven. I'll soon go back to heaven. But you are here. You are the living Jesus, right? You, we, you, we are now the living Jesus on the earth. Jesus says, upon you, I will build my church. The church belongs to Jesus, not to human beings. But he has given you his power and authority and his name because you have declared him as Lord. You know him as Lord. That all power and all authority belong to him. And that's why he, he has established you. Saying you are the rock means you are established. I bless you and I establish you. And no destruction can come back to you. Amen? No form of destruction. I have restored you. I, I establish you. And no gates of hell shall prevail against what I have done in your life. It does not matter what the world thinks. Jesus is the one who is building you. Don't let Satan tell you any different. Surrender your life to Jesus. He is the one building you. You as a person, as an individual, and us, the church, in general. Because we are individually the body of Christ. We represent him. We are the living Jesus. We are the temple of the most holy God. But the church is also the body of Christ. He, he establishes it. First he blesses you. Then he establishes you. Then he puts authority on his word on your life. And says, because you know my name, because you know who I am, you are mine today. And I put my authority on you, and no get of hell can prevail against it. Amen? So don't let what the world thinks or say deviate you from the eternal word of God. He, he, has, he has spoken over you. He has declared over you, you are Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. You are just the rock. I'm establishing you. You, are, you used to be called Simon. But now I change your name to Peter the Rock. Because through you, on you, I will start to show the world. Remember Psalm 103 verse 6? The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He does it for his name's sake so that it opens your eyes. To see who he is. To see what he can do. So after telling Peter. He, he, upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He puts another 
assurance. See, this is the, the second assurance, isn't it? First he blesses, then he establishes, and then verse 19. And I will give you the keys. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What more authority do we want? He, he, he blesses you, he establishes you, and he gives you the keys. Now just imagine, you received a set of keys through your mailbox, your physical, through your door, physical, a set of physical keys that says, the recipient of these keys on, you know, like, okay, the these keys, say, these keys belong to your new house. And they, they just said, push it through your door. These keys belong to your new house. And you're like, oh, yeah, I have a new house. Who sent it to me? I don't know. But where's the address? Which street? Which door? You see? You have keys, but you don't know what to use the key for. Because nobody has told you. You have no address. So you have to understand that when Jesus says, I am the way. So he gives you the keys and says, follow me. So you have keys to open any door when you walk with Jesus. Amen? You, he, he says, I am the way. He, you get the keys. Here he tells Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That means any door. But in our human mind, we, are, we start to look for a particular address. No. The key is a master key. The key that Jesus gives you opens any and all doors. We have to know it. He says, I am the way, I am the door, I am the gate. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can read that in John 14 verse 6. And he is not boasting. That's why he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? I am the way. No one. Because if you don't go through me, every other prophet that was has died. Jesus is the only one that declared his death and resurrection ahead of time and it happened exactly how he said it. And he is alive. He hears you and me right now as we speak. And he says, I establish you. I bless you. And I give you my authority. Those keys are his authority. He says, go in my name. Whichever door you knock and say, in the name of Jesus, the door opens because you have a master key. He sent his disciples on the day of um, uh, um, the, the triumphal entry. He says, go. You see... At a certain point, a donkey and a coat. Untie it. If anybody asks you, tell them the master needs it. That's all. The master needs it. And it happened exactly as he said. The prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament spoke about it. Jesus fulfilled it. Everything Jesus came to do was to fulfill everything Moses... We, we talked about it last week, isn't it? That... He is the fulfillment of everything the Psalms, the prophets, and the law talked about. So he came bodily, the word of God, to fulfill everything the word of God spoke about. The, the, the word of God became flesh. He came bodily. It's easy to, to say, all angels appear as human beings. 
If God can make angels appear as human beings, why can't God himself appear as a human being? You see, it, it boggles the mind. Because we try to understand God with, with human intellect, and it doesn't work. Only like we read today. Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. You cannot know God in your intellect. Because he's a God of love. You don't teach a baby to love his father or mother. The baby doesn't have to go to school to learn how to love daddy and mommy. He just loves. Because it's, it's how it should be. So let us understand the keys that we have are not just a physical key that will open a physical door. Remember Jesus after the resurrection? After he had died and came back after three days, he'll just appear in the room. And the disciples were like, this is the same person you were leaning on, John. This is the same person you were talking to, Peter. But now he is the resurrected Christ. You can't deal with him on the same basis anymore. He walks through walls. He doesn't need doors. So he has given us himself as the key to every door. Are we getting it? It's only just as your Holy Spirit help me get it. Holy Spirit help me get it. Holy Spirit help me get it. Jesus is the door. And when I walk with him, all doors are open because he has opened it to me. I cannot open it on myself, but he is opening the door to me. I walk through the door because Jesus is the door. He is the key. He is, he is everything. What use is a physical key when you don't know the house address or which door? You keep trying before you know they'll call police. There's, that guy is trying to break in. I've seen him try door number one, door number two, door number three because they'll think you are a thief. They'll arrest you. But Jesus is the way. Jesus is the authority. Whatever we bind on earth, because he has, we agree with him, he binds it in heaven. And whatever we lose on earth, he loses in heaven. That means because the key clicks every time. The key clicks. You, you put the key in the door, click, click, it opens. Click, click, it opens. There, there is an alignment. Any, the, once you put it in, click, click, it opens. Click, click, it opens. Because you are walking with the one who has all the authority. We need to get it. There is an agreement between heaven and earth. Remember uh, um, Jacob, he, he was sleeping. And then God opened his eyes and he saw angels ascending and descending. I said, he's like, this is the house of God, and what am I doing sleeping? You have that. You you are, you need to to have that that revelation. You your eyes need to open to the truth. We sit here and we think we are we are alone here. You are not alone here. Jesus is here. The angels of God are here. The Holy Spirit is here. But just because you don't see Him with your eyes, does it mean that He's not there? He is the air that you breathe. Without him, you have no life, no substance. The demons recognize Jesus. That, that's the whole point. The, his disciples that walked with him, he had to ask them, who do you think I am? But we know every time he walked into a place where there were demons, they start screaming. <gasps> Jesus, we know who you are, son of the living God. Have you come to destroy us before our time? They know that they have a set time for judgment. And Jesus appearing on earth meant judgment for them. They said, no, but God has said that there is an appointed time for judgment. I bet you've come earlier. Jesus is like, shut up and get out. I came to set the captives free. You have bound that person for too long. Get out. Go to the abyss and, and, and stay there until judgment day. So they knew. Demons knew Jesus because everything is spiritual. 
But human beings are waiting to touch. And, and he says, God executes righteousness and justice. So he produced, he, he, he provides the sun, the rain, the moon, the, everything. And, and we are still waiting to touch. Those in new age think that nature is God. They, they go and hug the tree. Oh, you give me, uh, you release carbon dioxide so I have oxygen to breathe. Is that, is that not mindlessness? Tree, how did you come to be? That's what we should ask. We have to understand, if the demons recognize Jesus, why can't we recognize Jesus? If Moses wrote about Jesus, why can't we read what Moses said? If the whole Test, Old Testament was there to, to point us towards the coming of Jesus because it clearly says that when Jesus comes, the spirit of Elijah will come first. And John the Baptist came. If you, if you read uh, Isaiah 40, he says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. And then I can read that for you. God wants your comfort. God wants your peace. God wants you to, to get it. The title of what we are treating today is knowing him. You have to know God. Isaiah 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended. All that tumult in you is ended. That her iniquity is pardoned. God has pardoned your sin by the blood of the sacrificial lamb. It goes on to say, For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. God wants to liberate you. And then verse 3. What John the Baptist came to do. Remember John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, not taught in the university. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Habakkuk says the glory of the Lord shall fill the whole earth as the water covers the sea. God wants you to know him. God wants you to acknowledge that when he does things for you, that you, you agree that he's the one doing it. That's why John the Baptist came to fulfill Isaiah chapter 40, preparing the way of the Lord. And Jesus confirmed it because the whole of the Old Testament, the New Testament shed light on the Old Testament and the Old Testament foretells the New. Remember the Jewish people that walked with Jesus, that wrote the New Testament that we are reading today. They had to find Jesus in their old Torah. The, everything in the Torah that was written about Jesus, that's how they, they recognized Jesus. So we have to understand, you don't teach about Jesus in the university. You sit at his feet and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the same God that taught David, the same God that taught Moses, the same God that walked with Elijah and Elisha and all the prophets. We read it here last week. Jesus is the revelation of the prophets, of the Psalms, of the law. Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. 
and not one jot, not one iota of, of the word shall be broken because I will fulfill all. And he did it to the T. He dotted every T and uh, crossed every T and dotted every I. And we have to open our eyes to receive that revelation just like Peter did. So we have to conclude because we haven't got any more time. My baseline is if demons recognize Jesus, what about you? If demons knew Jesus, what about you? Knowing him. Let's take one half minute and just ponder. What do I know about Jesus? What do I want to know about Jesus? How do I want to know about Jesus? Who is this Jesus that I should know him? Take a moment. Speak to your heart. If demons knew Jesus, why can't I know him? If the whole Bible talks about one man and his name is Jesus, where can I find him? How can I find him? Psalm 103 verse 7 says, He made known his ways to Moses. But his acts to the children of Israel. I want to be the Moses of my time. I want to know God like Moses knew him. Holy Spirit, make Jesus known to me. Reveal him to me. The same way Moses knew him and wrote about him. The same way David knew him and wrote about him. He says, my, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David saw Jesus and wrote about him. I want to know Jesus like David knew him. I need to know this word of God that spoke to the prophets, that spoke to kings, that gave the law. I want to know you, Lord. I want to see you. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to dine with you. You, God dined with the children of Israel on the mountain when they left Egypt. The physical presence of God was there. They heard his physical voice. So he's not a faraway God. He is an intimate God. I want to be intimate with you, Lord. Like Moses was. Let us Confess your sin. Release. We read in gems today. Cleanse your hands. Purify your hearts. Confess your sins. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Submit to his lordship. Surrender your heart and your mind and your will to him. He is not taking anything away from you. Once you give him your wretchedness, he will give you his righteousness and holiness and, and his majesty, his splendor. He just says, get ready. It's like a child holding one pound coin, a one pound coin, and you want to give him a five pound note. But because they have the one pound and they, know, they don't know the value between one pound and the five pound paper you hold, they, refi they refuse to release the one pound to you. That's exactly what it is. Release whatever you hold to Jesus. He wants to give you more. The child prefers that coin because it looks like money. The five pound doesn't look like money to a child. But God wants more for you. 
than you already have. Release it. Let it go. Proclaim him as Lord and Savior and Redeemer. Declare like Peter did, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Pray in your heart. I'm going to read a short prayer. First I will read it. Give you the chance to think about, listen to it and think about. And then I'll read it a second time with breaks and you can repeat. So, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I have sinned against you. My forefathers have sinned against you. And this sin has separated us from you and from your love. I repent of my sin today and that of my generations before me. Other than you, there is no other way of salvation. You have the keys of heaven. There is no other way I can get to heaven without you. Except you give me the keys, I can't get there. And so I turn away from everything that has separated me from you. I turn away from everything that has stopped me from knowing you. I choose willingly and consciously. Nobody is forcing me. I choose to acknowledge and follow you. I want to know you. I choose you to be, to be Lord of my life in every aspect of my life and I honor you. Thank you for your love for me. Come and live in me by the power of your Holy Spirit. I need you, Holy God. Heavenly Father, grant this prayer in Jesus' name. So that's about the, the shape of the prayer. So now I will read line by line and give you the chance to repeat out loud. Because Peter had to declare among all the disciples you are Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then God blessed him. You don't have to say it, but you, when you say it, believe it, because it is true. It's the word of God. So, prayer. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, acknowledge I acknowledge that I have sinned Speak with confidence if you know what you are saying. I have sinned. I have My, forefathers have sinned. My forefathers have sinned. And this sin, and this sin has, separated us from you. has separated us from you. I repent of my sin today. And that of my generations before me. Other than you. There is no other way of salvation because you hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I turn away from everything that has separated me from you. I turn away from everything that has stopped me from knowing you. I choose willingly and consciously to acknowledge and follow you. I want to know you. I choose you to be Lord of my life in every aspect of my life. And I honor you. Thank you for your love for me. Come and live in me by the power of your Holy Spirit because I need you, Holy God. And then, Heavenly Father, grant this prayer more than we can think of or imagine because we have asked in the matchless name of the anointed one Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. You can rejoice. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Glory be to God.